Hello and welcome. I'm Yael Friedman, former director of international programs at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust, and a current educational consultant with the Auschwitz Jewish Center. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's special 20th anniversary program, the town known as Auschwitz. Auschwitz is known to many as the ultimate symbol of the Holocaust, but the town of Auschwitz, the Polish name for Auschwitz, has a rich Jewish history that predates the camp. The Auschwitz Jewish Center, a satellite location of the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Poland, is the only Jewish presence remaining in the vicinity of Auschwitz. The Auschwitz Jewish Center commemorates Auschwitz's Jewish community, preserves Jewish memory in the town, and educates about the contemporary dangers of anti-Semitism and other forms of prejudice. We are fortunate to have with us today two longtime staff members of the center. Tomek Kunsevich has served as the director of the Auschwitz Jewish Center since it opened in 2000. He received a master's degree in English studies from Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan, as well as a master's degree in Jewish history with distinction from Brandeis University. In addition, he studied Jewish history in Krakow, Budapest, and Jerusalem. Tomek has organized and led extensive study programs on Holocaust history, Jewish history, and heritage, as well as diversity education programs for Polish, German, and Icelandic law enforcement, Polish teachers and educators, international graduate students, and cadets and midshipmen from U.S. service academies. Maciek Zaborowski, head of learning at the Auschwitz Jewish Center, has been there since 2006. He received a master's degree in Holocaust history from the Jagiellonian University and is a graduate of multiple Holocaust education seminars, including Facing History and Ourselves in London, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and the International School of Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem. Maciek oversees educational programming for Polish and international students, cadets and midshipmen from US service academies, teachers and law enforcement officers. He has also designed digital learning projects at the center, including the Google Arts and Culture site and the center's mobile app, Oshpitzen. We will put links, in the, links to these in the chat. Both Tomek and Maciek are certified anti-discrimination educators in Poland. This special 20th anniversary program will explore the Jewish history of the town through artifacts in the Auschwitz Jewish Center collection. A brief agenda for today's program. Tomek will begin with an introduction to Jewish Oshwenshim and the Auschwitz Jewish Center. Maciek will then lead a workshop highlighting some of the artifacts related to the Jewish history of the town. And we will have time for Q&A at the end of the workshop. Please feel free to post any questions throughout the program using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Thank you to those who have already donated to the Auschwitz Jewish Center. We greatly appreciate your support to ensure the continuation of our efforts to create meaningful commemorative and educational programs at the center. We will put a donation link in the chat for those who would still like to donate. This program is being recorded. We will send it in a link in a follow-up email and we'll post it on the museum's website in the coming days. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Tomek and Maciek. Uh, hello and welcome from Poland. Uh, thank you, Al, for the introductions. Uh, as it has been mentioned, um, I will give an overview of the Jewish history in Oświęcim, the town which is located next to the former site of Auschwitz, as well as the programs of the Auschwitz Jewish Center. We will be showing also some images related to the history and the activities of the Auschwitz Jewish Center. Um, Jewish settlement in Oshvinshin dates back to the second half of the 16th century, and most of them uh, were migrants coming from the Czech and German lands escaping persecution. In 1772, Oshvinshin came under Austrian rule, and this part of Poland was renamed Galicia. In 1867, the Austro-Hungarian emperor granted Jews equal rights and the first Jewish members of Oshvenshim's town council were elected. At the same time, Oshvenshim became an important railway junction, prompting economic development in the area. Jewish merchants and industrialists played a crucial role in this process. In 1918, Poland regained independence and Oshvenshim was again part of the reborn Polish Republic. This was also the time when the Jewish community of Oshvenshim enjoyed its most dynamic development. 
the town council had strong Jewish representation, including the deputy mayor, and Jews and Christians worked together in numerous charitable and patriotic organizations. However, the early 20th century also saw two waves of anti-Semitism, the first in the autumn of 1918 and the second during the economic depression of the 1930s. By the end of the 1930s, the Jewish inhabitants of Oshvinchim constituted almost 60% of the total population. This was about 8,000 people um, in, in town. On September 3rd, 1939, the German army captured Oshvinchim, renamed the town Auschwitz and incorporated it into Germany. In spring uh, 1941, all the Jews in Oshvinchim were expelled to ghettos in Benjin, Khshanov, and Sosnovitz. In 1943, most of the ghetto inhabitants were sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau Auschwitz and murdered. On January 27th, 1945, the Red Army liberated Oshvinchim and the camps of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Only a handful of Oshvinchim Jews survived the Holocaust. Those who returned to Oshvinchim struggled to find living relatives and attempted to reorganize a Jewish community. A quasi-civil war caused by the imposition of communist rule in Poland, anti-Semitism and economic hardship ultimately drove the few surviving Jews to emigrate. In the 1960s, the last Jewish families left Oshvinchim. The only exception was Shimon Kluger, who returned to Oshvinchim in 1961 and lived in his family home until his death in 2000. The year 2000 uh, marks also the beginning of the Arshu Jewish Center, which was inaugurated with the renovation and reopening of the only remaining synagogue in town. In the following years, we renovated two more adjacent historic buildings, the home of the Deckner and Kornreich families, which now houses the Jewish museum devoted to the history of a Spitzin. This is the Jewish name for the town and the Kluge House, which was adapted into Cafe Bergson and a museum store. Last year, we also opened the Great Synagogue Memorial Park, which commemorates the Great Synagogue of, of the town destroyed by the Germans in November, 1939. Uh, the work of, of the Auschwitz Jewish Center can be divided into two main parts. Uh, one is the commemoration of the destroyed Jewish community through the renovated synagogue, the Jewish museum, uh, and the commemorative and educational projects such as the Memorial Park, which opened uh, last year. It can serve as a model of how to commemorate other destroyed Jewish communities in Europe. The other is Holocaust education, which includes human rights education today. We run such programs for students, teachers, law enforcement, US cadets and midshipmen. We strongly believe that the education about this tragic history cannot be limited to the historical facts, but needs to address the mechanisms of exclusion today, whether it is anti-Semitism, racism or homophobia, with the hope that it can serve as an immunity shot against hatred today. Um, thank you. And now uh, the floor goes to Maciek. Thank you, Tomek, for the introduction. And uh, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to take you for a journey in time and uh, take a step further and dig a little deeper with you into the Jewish history of the town of Oświęcim, arguably one of the least imaginable Jewish histories in the world because of what happened next door to the Jewish town of Oświęcim during uh, World War II and, and the Holocaust. And what I'm, going to, uh, what I'm going to be showing you in a moment will be pictures, images of objects, highlights from our, uh, highlights from our exhibition which will be then also contextualized with additional objects and we'll, we'll get them explained. But before this happens, I, with each of the objects, I would like to pause for a moment and ask you to think what you think this, this particular object on the screen could be, what kind, what, what your associations are, 
if you've ever seen a similar object in any way or does it remind you of anything? And so we'll be going chronologically from the oldest object to the most recent one. And the one that I'm going to show you first is what you can see on the screen. And I can see people typing in headstone on tombstone, exactly that's, uh, that's what it is. What you're looking at at this very moment, excuse me, is the gravestone of Rabbi Abraham Abba, who died in 1757. And the reason why I'm showing you this is it's because this is the, the oldest material trace of Jewish presence in the town of Oshinchen. Tomek was explaining a moment ago, and he was showing you the, um, the oldest document from 1588. This was the, the donation of land for the establishment of the first synagogue. So that's a document. But when it, come, when it comes to physical traces of Jewish presence, this is the oldest one that we have. So the oldest tombstone of a rabbi, Abraham Abba, son of Asher Zelig, who died in 1757. And this object is, is stored in our, is presented, has been conserved and is presented in our, in our museum in the town, in the town of Oshvenshim. At the same time, the Asher Jewish Center is also preserving the, the, re, the remaining Jewish cemetery, uh, which is a 19th century cemetery in the outskirts of, uh, of the town of Oshvenshim. It was destroyed completely during, uh, during the Holocaust and during the war by the Germans. After the war, it was partly renovated. We managed to recover uh, a number of tombstones. And one of the projects taking place at the cemetery, next to it being a, a site of, of historical education for our visitors from, from Poland, United States, and beyond, is also a conservation project. Each year, participants made the cadets and mids participating in, in the American Service Academies program, which is implemented with the Museum of Jewish Heritage and the Asher Jewish Center and the four military academies. They're doing conservation works, they're doing cleaning works, and they're, uh, they're making sure that this cemetery is was well preserved, which uh, is coordinated by the Asher Jewish Center, also with the contributions of the, of the, local, of the municipality of, uh, of Oshinchim. So the, the oldest Jewish uh, the oldest Jewish tombstone in the town, 1757. It's presented at the, at the Jewish Museum, operated by the Austrian Jewish Center. The next object I wanted to present to you is a very special one. Uh, it's a bottle. Uh, and I'm very curious whether anyone can read the, the label or partly at least figure out what it says, what kind of a, what kind of a bottle it is. So I'll be, I'll be looking at the chat if anyone has any suggestions for this. It's scotch, Shabbat wine. Uh-huh. It's uh, indeed, it's Shabbat Bronfen. So it is actually a Shabbat vodka, strong alcohol, which was produced at the Jacob Haberfeld factory. And this bottle was donated to our museum by one of the local, uh, local uh, Catholic collectors who, um, who's also much uh, dedicated to preserving local Jewish, uh, Jewish history. And this, this is a bottle, so this is a bottle for alcohol, for Shabbat, for the holiday of, of, uh, of Shabbat. And it was made at this particular factory, the Jacob Haberfeld factory, which was the first ever factory to be established in Eschwinchim. The history goes way back to 1804. Uh, and what you can see in front of you right now, it's a postcard from, er, from early 1930s, showing the entrance to the town right at the very, at the very, um, at the very first, uh, the very first piece of the old city, of the old town of Oshinchim was the, the house, which belonged to the, to the Jacob Haberfeld family, to, to Haberfeld family uh, and was part of the Jacob Haberfeld liquor factory, uh, liquor factory complex. Now, this was a family business, which, like I said, was established at the, very, at the beginning of 19th century, at the time when Oshinchim was then called Auschwitz. During the Austrian time, this was the time when Poland was not existing as a political entity. It was. It has been by then partitioned by three neighboring states. One of them was Austria, and Oshvinch was part of was part of Austria. The, the Austrian partition of Poland, oftentimes referred to as the Galicia, not to be confused with the Galicia in in Spain. So Galicia, the Austrian partition of Poland, um, Oshvinch was part of it. Uh, Jacob Haberfeld uh, established his factory. It was a family business. It was passed down, uh, and then in 1930s. In 1930s, about the time when this photo was taken, the owners and their names were Alphonse and Felicia, they um, got their invitation to present the products from this, fact from this factory, from their business at the International Fair in New York. And this was in 1939, in the summer of 1939. 
uh, they got this, this invitation. Their daughter at the time was three years old. And we know that decided, they decided they had an argument whether to go or not to go. But ultimately, they decided they would go to New York. But since their child was so, so little, they left their daughter with her grandmother, with Felicia's mother, in the nearby city of Krakow. And they, they set off for, for the journey to New York. And as a lot of you would know, back at the time in 1930s, you, in order to get from Poland or wherever in Europe to the United States, you would have to take, uh, take a ship. And this is, what they, this is what they did. And what we have for you is a very short piece of the video testimony with Felicia Haberfeld. So the owner, then owner of the factory, describing her way back from New York to Poland on a ship. And you have to imagine this is 1939. This is the end of August 1939. And let's see how the events unfolded for the Haberfelds. You should be able to listen, watch and listen to the video in, in a moment. And my husband said, I am going mm -hmm. because I have everything and everybody there. So no matter what, we are going. And sure enough, a small group of our people left. About 48 hours before we reached the port of Gdynia, we were watching a movie. One night was a movie, one, one night was a dance. That night was a movie with Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. I remember vividly. The film was interrupted and the purser came on the stage and he asked to please be quiet and control yourself. He has a, something to announce and the announcement said that our ship no longer is going to Poland but has been taken by the British Admiralty and we are heading toward some place we didn't know where. He did, I don't think he knew where either. Well, what was happening there I'll never forget. Women were getting hysterical, screaming, crying. Men were fainting. It was, some, it was something terrible, and I was sitting like, like a stone. I just couldn't move. There were several, a whole group of Polish priests and nuns traveling, and they all got on their hands and knees, and they gave first aid to those who fainted. And, and since that time on, our odyssey started. We never made it home. So during the war, neither Alphonse nor uh, Felicia returned to Poland. They actually, what happened immediately after uh, the events that were described here is that the ship was diverted to Scotland. They had to go, they had to stay on board for the next two weeks of quarantine, and then they were forced to go on land. And this was the end of the journey. And we know from the rest of this, uh, of this testimony, which was made available to us by Club 1939, an organization of survivors from, from Los Angeles, which was established by Felicia Haberfeld herself. We know from that, from that testimony that um, they, tried, they tried all the ways to extract the daughter who found herself with her family in the Nazi-occupied Poland. They tried to extract her in many different ways, but unfortunately the, it didn't work. The, the daughter, the, Franciszka remained with her grandmother in Krakow, in the city of Krakow, also known as Krakow uh, in, in English or Kraka in Yiddish. She, um, as Jewish citizens, they were forced by the Germans who occupied the, the city into the ghetto, which was established in 1941. They survived both uh, Franciszka and her grandmother survived the whole two years of the ghetto in Krakow. And during the final deportations in the winter of 1943, the hideout of the daughter was found by the Germans and uh, both 
the granddaughter and her grandmother, they were sent to the death center at Bełżec and they were, they were murdered. And uh, most of the relatives of, from all of the, most of the members of the Haberfeld family who remained in Nazi occupied Poland were murdered in the, in the Holocaust. The couple who became stuck on their way back to Poland from New York, from the US, they, they became stuck, they, they remained in, in the UK first, in Scotland, then in the United Kingdom, and then they, they emigrated to the United States and they, they, this is where they lived the rest of their lives, first, first in Baltimore and then in, uh, in Los Angeles, and they never became as successful as they were in, uh, in Oświęcim. Felicia Haberfeld passed away 15 years ago in, the, in 2005 at the age of 1998. The site of the factory was confiscated by Nazis during the war. It was used as, uh, as military barracks. After the war, it was confiscated by the Polish communists during the communist time. Um, and it was used for production of sodas. And then in 2003, after the fall of communism in free Poland, it was in such a bad condition that it had to be taken down. Recently, the site of, uh, next to the site of the, of the factory, there is, oh, excuse me, <laughs> next to the site, uh, let me just stop this. Next to the site of, um, of the factory, there is a, there's a memorial. Some of you may be familiar with this concept of stumbling stones. This is a German concept called Stolperstein. These are those little brass pieces which are installed um, in locations where uh, victims of the Holocaust, but also victims of other, uh, of the victims of Nazi persecution lived or died. And with the, this stum the stumbling stone, the Stolperstein was installed last year by the artist who's Günther Demnisch, it's a German artist who is the author of the, of the project of this particular type of memorialization, which is quite common all over Europe, especially Western Europe, but all over, Poland included. And it says, here lived Franciszka Henrika Haberfeld, born 1937, who was imprisoned in the ghetto of Krakow and then murdered in Belgium in, 1940, uh, in 1942. So this is a, a stumbling stone, which right now commemorates the, uh, which is, in a strange way, it commemorates, uh, commemorates Franciszka Haberfeld, but there's also on the site, there's also a plaque which explains the history of the Haberfeld, uh, of the Haberfeld family and what happened with them during, um, during the Holocaust. So here is another glimpse into, the, into a life of, of a single, of a single uh, but a very prominent Jewish family from the town, uh, from the town of, um, of Oświęcim. Now, I wanted to direct your attention to a, a sort of like a separate thread. And I wanted to, again, ask you, what do you think this is? Where could this have been used? Because right now it's misplaced in our, it's in our museum, but it's a very, it's, a, it's an object, it's an important object, connect, object connected to a very important site. It is indeed a chandelier. Thank you, Emily. Mm -hmm. It's a candelabra. It, and it's a, shamble, it's a chandelier from, indeed, it's a chandelier from a synagogue. It's a very special chandelier from the great synagogue in Oświęcim. If you take a closer look, you'll see it's made of brass and it's got a, a double-headed eagle, which is a symbol at the time was a symbol of, uh, of the Austrian Empire, since this is a, a chandelier which was hanging in the great synagogue of, uh, of Oświęcim. This was the most important, most prominent Jewish house of prayer in, in 19th and 20th, early 20th century of Oświęcim. This is a synagogue which was built on the site of that first synagogue from 1588. The previous building must have been made of wood. Oświęcim suffered a lot of fires throughout its history and invasions. And in 1863, this building was dedicated. The great synagogue, this is the building on the left, obviously, right? You can see when you compare, when you take a closer look at this postcard, this is a postcard from early 20th century. Uh, from this is still from the time of Galicia, the Austrian partition, which ended with the end of World War I in 1918. Hence, if you'll see that the, the caption is both in German, Judengasse und Synagoge, and in Polish, Ulica Żydowska i Burznica Wojtwinczymi, which translates in English uh, into it's the Oświęcim, the Jewish street, and the synagogue in well, in Oświęcim. So again, looking at the comparing the proportions of people in the building, you can clearly see that it was a it was a prominent it was a prominent building. This was the most important and the largest synagogue in 1930s. 
it's estimated there were around 20 different sites of Jewish sites of prayer in the town of Ashvinchim. Let me just remind you that this is the time when 60% of the town's population was uh, was Jewish. So 20 different houses of prayer. Uh, most of them were Hasidic Shtiblach, but there were also some individual buildings. And uh, this one was the most uh, the most important one. I can give you another view taken from the other side of the river, the river Soa, which divides the town into sort of like two halves. And the building to the a little bit to the right, and this is the back of the great synagogue. So again, you can see that it's a uh, it's a it's a large building, and this is also where the chandelier comes from. And the reason why we have the chandelier has to do with the fate of the building at the beginning of the war. So Tom had already mentioned that, um, that the Shvinchim was captured by the Nazis, and this was in the first days of September 1939, Auschwitz was, was captured by the, by the German army. It was renamed Auschwitz for another time, because this is exactly the, the same name that was used during the Austrian time, so the name was there already. Um, and there were very harsh discriminatory measures directed against the local population. The most harsh measures were directed against, against the Jews of the Jews of Auschwitz, the Auschwitz at the time. Uh, but the non-Jews were also were also suffering terror. And uh, but what happened as far as the Jewish community and its fate? Uh, a very important mark in the beginning of the occupation was uh, was the destruction of the Great Synagogue. This is what what happened in at the end of November 1939. We're approaching the 80, 81st anniversary. Uh, November 29th and 30th, 1939, is when the synagogue, the great synagogue was was taken down by the Nazis on the Nazi order. And the photo you can see in front of you, this is uh, second half of 1940. So this is uh, almost like a year after those events. And this is, you can see the prisoners of Auschwitz. If you take a closer look at, at, the, at the people here, they're wearing striped uniforms. So these are some of the first prisoners of the Auschwitz. At the time when it was established as a concentration camp, this is before the Holocaust started, meaning the systematic murder of Jews at the camps before it all started. Auschwitz was modeled after the German concentration camps in the Third Reich. It was a concentration camp and prisoners were forced as part of, of their forced labor. They were transferred to the site of the great synagogue in the town and they had to continue the demolition and clear away the rubble. So these are the final accords of the existence of the of the great synagogue. You can see there's on the left hand side, on, on the left side of the picture, you can see there is still a wall. In a moment, it's going to be taken down, and the site will be, uh, and the site the site will be uh, cleared, cleared completely. So since 19, 1940 until um, until 2000, it was just a, an empty piece of land with grass, where we installed a memorial uh, a memorial plaque with some photographs. The Auschwitz Jury Center. This is what we did. But the most recent development, which was also um, referenced by, by Tomek, was the unveiling of the Great Synagogue Memorial Park. One of the most important projects uh, of the Austrian Jury Center in the, in the recent decade is commemoration, and it, in our history in general, is the commemoration of the most important synagogue of the town. Uh, and it happened on the exact 80th anniversary of the destruction. So um, on the 29th, of, 29th of November 19, uh, 2000, I'm sorry, 29 November 2000, uh, 2019, we unveiled the Great Synagogue Memorial Plaque. What you can see on the screen right now is an aerial view. And there's an outline. We used flowers to outline the building. And inside there's, there's a memorial, which was, which was designed by, by Polish, Polish designers and architects from, uh, from Krakow. Uh, there's a triangular element a, a bit to the, to the top right edge, which has a 3D model of the synagogue. There's also a plaque. Uh, there's also a plaque with um, with the, explaining the history. There's also a plaque of, of donors. The town of Ashvinchim contributed, was a major contributor. We had uh, we had also contributors uh, from the crowdfunding campaigns, which were uh, which ran both in the United States and the world, and also in the town of Ashvinchim. A lot of a lot of residents also uh, also contributed, and we were able to unveil this park in presence of a Holocaust survivor from Ashvinchim. Who traveled all the way? Uh, who traveled all the way from Sweden? She was a graduate of the uh, um, of a school, of a pre-war school in uh, in uh, Auschwitz, and she made it with her family. We had fifty family members, descendants of Jews from Auschwitz, who came from the United States, from from Israel, and from from Scandinavian from Scandinavian countries, as well. And the park is is is, is there. 
since then and uh, people are able to visit and learn about this uh, about this unique unique history mm -hmm. another object from our collection um which is presented a lot by us is this photograph and i'll be curious to know if uh, you have any associations looking at this photo when it might have been taken who are the girls why am i why why do we choose this particular photo to uh, to show you i would be i would be curious to know uh, opinions of our viewers if anyone's uh, is willing uh, to share on the chat and i'll be explaining this uh, in a moment this is a very unique story in many uh, in many regards they look like sailors says Mark. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, so they're wearing very particular, very particular uniforms, remind you of sailors, they, uh, girl scouts, uh, youth group members, school girls. Uh -huh. Yes, it's so what you can see in front of you is a photograph of two friends. The one on the left is Marta Sviderska, the one on the right is Olga Pressler. They were best friends from school. Uh, the, the girl on the left, Marta, uh, was Catholic. The girl on the right, Olga, was Jewish. And the photo was taken. They're wearing their school uniforms. These are Polish school uniforms from the interwar period. Uh, and this, the photo was taken on the September 1st, uh, 1934. September 1st tra uh, traditionally is the, the first day of school in Poland. So this is the first day of school. And the girls had their photo taken, which at the time was very unique for the girls of their age and their they went to a high school in Oświęcim. The, the building is the building is still there, Stanisław Konarski High School. So for the girls of their age, it was very rare to have photos taken. Like you know, in those years, 1920s, 1930s, nobody had a camera. It so happened that uh, that Olga's, the Jewish girl's father, Martin, was a photographer in Oświęcim. So he invited the girls uh, after the you know opening of the school school year, after the inauguration, to. Um, to have their photo taken and this is how this is how how it happened now um this story also does not have uh, does not have a happy end olga pressler the, the jewish girl you can see her photo on the left when the war started and their family and there were four of them there was the photographer martin his wife matilda and they had two kids olga and her brother joseph so when the war started um they lost the the photographics the photographic studio so they lost the means of supporting the family. And in 1941, as Tomek mentioned before, the Jews of Auschwitz had to report to the main market square and the square in front of the synagogue, and they were taken to free neighboring ghettos, to Benjin, Sosnovet, and Shanov. And in the case of, of the Presslers, they were forced to resettle to the ghetto in Sosnovet. Those of you who have read the graphic novel Mouse by Arch Spiegelman, the bulk uh, of, um, of the events take place in that very ghetto, in the ghetto of Sosnovit. So this is where Olga was forced to, forced to live. And from the ghetto in Sosnovit, the Presslers were sent in 1943, they were sent to Auschwitz and murdered. And in the, in the right part of the, of the screen, you can see this is a scan of, the, of a page of testimony written by Joseph Pressler, Olga's brother, the only survivor, the only survivor from, uh, from the family, who said, who explains that his, his uh, sister was born in, in, in Krakow, actually, so not in Krakow, this is, uh, this is the major city next door to Oshvinchim, uh, in 1922, and she was murdered in, um, in Auschwitz, this is in 1943, so she was 20, she was 21 when she was uh, when she was married. Now the photo that you saw a moment ago was donated to us by Marta Świderska, the other girl from the picture, the Christian, the Catholic girl who was friends with the Jewish girl, with the Jewish girl, with with uh, with Olga. Those friendships were quite rare at the time; they were not part of the social norm. But these girls were friends, and Marta survived the war as a Catholic woman. Uh, she kept this photo with her the entire life, and in her senior year she came to our museum, which actually she did a lot of times, and she uh, she donated this photo and several others, which were the only things, uh, which are the only th the only things for her to remember uh, to remember her best her best friend. Another photo and another object, actually, a photo of an object that I wanted to share with you is this one. Now this is all in Polish, so some of you may be finding it hard to uh, to figure out the content. But even if you look at the script itself um the shape of the object uh you might be you might be uh you might be able to 
to figure out uh, what this what this might be. Do you is there is there any guess? School journal diary. Mm -hmm. Barbara and Emily. Uh huh. A passport says Gail. Uh huh. Journal and diary. Now, a lot of you are saying it, that it looks like a diary or a composition book. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what you're looking at is a notebook. It's a school notebook of Henrik Enoch. Henrik was just another Jewish boy living in the 1930s. He was born in 1932, which meant that in 1939, he was supposed to go to school. The school age in Poland at the time was seven. So Henrik was supposed to go, go to school on September 1st. Remember the first day of school, 1939. Well, September 1st is when the World War II started in Europe. This is the day when, when Germany attacked Poland. Uh, all the schools uh, were not opened, right? They, they never opened during the war. Uh, so Henrik could not go to school. And uh, Oświęcim was incorporated to Germany, became part of the Third Reich. Uh, and schools, schools were students, pupils, Polish pupils, Jewish and Catholic were barred from schools at all, completely. There was just no way for them to go to schools. It's slightly different than other parts of Poland, which were not incorporated into Third Reich, but made into a general government, a buffer state where Catholics could go to schools, but Jews couldn't, Catholics could go to schools, Jews couldn't. Here in Oświęcim and Auschwitz, nobody could go to school, except for the German children who settled, just nobody. So there is just no way for Henrik to be writing this at a school, because this is in Polish and this is a school notebook and Henrik was a Jewish boy. So he was, he was just not allowed to go to school at all. So the question could be, how come this particular notebook? And you know, when you read those, of, for those of you who know some Polish, you can see these are some very basic sentences. And like the, on the right, on the right page, it says Auschwitz, 19th of May, 1940, assignment. And then you have some random words like kids, sitting, bell, break, eat. And then Henrik went on to create some sentences. The kids went to school. They're sitting in the classroom and they're writing an assignment. The bell is ringing, it's a break, it's a break, they're eating rolls, and then there's another date. So this is a description of a scene taking place in a classroom that Henrik himself never witnessed. It's, it might, it, it, this must have been said to him by, uh, by, by the teacher, by the teacher or somebody else. Well, in this case, what we're talking about is a secret education. So a clandestine education, which was organized by uh, by, by a Catholic lady, Jadziga Mercinek, I'm going to tell you about her in, uh, in a moment. And here again, what happened is uh, that the whole family of Enox had to report to the market square in 1941, and they were all escort, under the German escort, they were sent to the ghetto. In their case, it was Benjin. You may, be rem you may rem remember that I mentioned three, three different locations to where people were sent, Jews were sent from Oświęcim, those was Benjin, Sosnowiec, and Hrshanov. In case of the Enoch family, it was Benjin. So they ended up in the, in the Benjin ghetto, and this is where, uh, this is where uh, Henrik died. So he did not survive the war. He died in the ghetto, uh, in the ghetto of Benjin. But on that occasion, I wanted, uh, and we have, we also have, we also have a, a page of testimony which was, which was submitted to, uh, to the Yad Vashem Institute by, uh, by his cousin, Felicia Englander, who survived the war, and she went on to explain that that Henrik Enoch, the son of Rosa Gita and Jakob, was killed, was murdered in the in the in the Holocaust, and he died in the ghetto of Benjamin, which is the fate of the most, almost all Jewish children who lived uh, in the Shvintim at the time. But on that occasion, I also wanted to mention this remarkable lady, Jadwiga Marciniak, who was a primary school teacher in pre-war Shvintim. She taught Polish. And this is exactly the lady who took in Henrik, but also other Jewish children to her home to teach them. So what she managed to do against the rules of the German occupation is she, she stood up, she recognized this discrimination, she stood up against it. And she uh, and she took in Henrik and she taught him. Uh, and she did this knowing very well that if she was found out, she would be immediately sent to Auschwitz, no questions asked, because in the very town next to Auschwitz, you could be taken to the camps for, for any infringement of the Nazi rules. But nevertheless, she decided to do this. What's more, she decided to continue and she persisted 
persevered, even though her husband, who was also a teacher, which often happens, right? Um, her husband, who was also doing secret education, was found out and he was actually sent to a concentration camp, not to Auschwitz. Uh, she, uh, he was sent to a concentration camp in, in, in Austria, in today's Austria, in Mauthausen, and he died. He was murdered here, actually. He was murdered there. And even though she, re she knew that this, had, this is what happened, she got a notification, she, she still taught children uh, in secret. Um, and we present the notebook of Henrik Enoch um, and this remarkable story in our museum. Actually, we have uh, we have one more notebook, a notebook of math, and this is a photograph from our from our uh, from our museum. Um, this those those notebooks actually were donated to us by the family of Jadwiga Malchina. Jadwiga herself passed away in 1980. This is. Uh, 20 years before the establishment of the Asher Jewish Center and the Jewish Museum, but a member of her family kept the notebooks as well, and uh, they know they donated them uh, to us, and they are in our in our collection. They are presented, and we always tell we always tell the story because we think that it's very it's not it's, it's not only unique but it's also very inspiring um, for those of us who are willing or contemplating whether to stand up. Uh, for those who are in need and for those who are dis uh, discriminated against and persecuted. So uh, this remarkable example, I think, is a very, um, is a very telling one. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy that I had the chance to share with you some highlights from, uh, from our collection of the Jewish Museum, some artifacts from the collection of the Jewish Museum, which tell the story of one of the least imaginable uh, Jewish communities in the, in the world, the Jewish community of the town of Auschwitz. Thank you. Thank you, Maciek. Um, and thank you all for sending in your questions uh, through the chat and through the Q&A function. Um, so I am, I will pose the questions to Maciek and Tomek um, and they can answer them. Uh, we will do our best to get to all of your questions. Uh, many of them have been responded to in the Q&A uh, function. So please um, double check in case uh, somebody has written out a response to you. Um, so there have been a few questions about the diversity of Jewish life in pre-war Auschwitz. Um, so questions about Zionist groups, um, Hasidic versus Orthodox versus secular Jews. Can you expand a little bit about what that looked like in the population? Um, I think you can hear me, yes? Yes, okay. Uh, yes, uh, the Jewish community of Eshvinchim uh, was very diverse. At the same time, still the majority of the Eshvinchim Jews were, were religious, were Orthodox. There were also several Hasidic groups. This was the sort of most Western town uh, where Hasidism was still present further west. There was no more Hasidic uh, Jews. Um, Zionism was very, very present. Um, and there were several Zionist groups active in Ashvinchim. There was this, of course, the whole movement to, to uh, emigrate to Palestine and to build uh, a Jewish state. Um, yeah, so Maciek, maybe you have something to add? It's basically what I wanted to say, Tomek. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that was in, that was that was indeed that was indeed a large large diversity of the Jewish life in the Shvinchim, even though, as Tomek said, it was predominantly Hasidic. But we like to say there was a that the Shvinchim was a microcosm of Jewish life in Poland uh, in Poland before the war, because next to the re religious aspect itself, you could also you could also say that there was a whole array of of different Jewish movements, right, and included Zionism. I uh, in the presentation you had a a quick look at 
uh, the Jewish Sports Club, Kadima, which was a Zionist organization, right? There was, a, there was also um, a chapter, there was also a chapter for women. There were also other political groups, including com communists and socialism, uh, socialists, right? There was also a strong representation of Aguda Israel, so the Orthodox Party. So you could really see a lot of Jewish life uh, and, different, and, and different ways that it manifested itself in the interwar, uh, in the interwar Shvinchim, so at the time when 60% of the town's population, so 8,000 people out of 14,000 total were, uh, were Jews. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, similarly, or relatedly, um, there are some questions about um, what were the Jewish and non-Jewish relations uh, before the Holocaust, and also what, a, what are the, the current, the local population today, what's their mm -hmm. reaction to the Auschwitz Jewish Center? Well, uh, the the relations, I mean, the relations between Jews and non-Jews in pre-war Europe, in pre-war Poland, in pre-war Schwinchim, of course, it's a huge subject and very complex. Uh, generally speaking, in Schwinchim and in Poland, uh, the Jewish community was, the majority of the Jewish community was pretty separate from the non-Jewish community. I mean, there was, of course, uh, a big part of the community was religious. Some of these people didn't speak Polish very well, they spoke Yiddish. So there was a level of separation. And of course there was also prejudice. There was also of course anti-Semitism. Uh, so complexity at the same time um, during, during the interwar time, this was sort of, you know, Poland did not exist for about 120 years uh, before 1918. So this sort of kind of closest to Polishness was already was only kind of happening or developing more during this short time of 20 years. And there was a growing uh, group of Polish Jews who became you know, very much part of the Polish culture and very active in the Polish culture. And uh, there are a lot of people, you know, poets and, and uh, people with uh, a lot of you know, famous people really in the cultural landscape of Poland were Jewish. So this, is, this was you know, kind of a time of change, but at the same time, of course, a very difficult time for, for the Jewish community um, in Poland, but also in the Shvinchim, we can say. Regarding the, the current situation uh, and the reactions towards our museum, our center, there's definitely a group, a group, a, a, quite a big group of people who are very interested and uh, visit and come and come to events. We also have a very nice cafe where a lot of local people come. So there, there's definitely quite a strong part of the local community who see this as part of their heritage. And I think this is really kind of also our goal to make sure that Jewish heritage is part of the heritage of the town and it's part of Polish heritage. Sorry, um, related to that, what uh, type of educational programs do you offer uh, to the local community? Marcek. Sure, yeah, very gladly. So yeah, we work quite closely with the local community, uh, including both the residents uh, and the town, the municipality, right? We, we re actually receive regular support for projects from the municipality uh, of Oshvinchim for projects related to both members and, uh, and education. So we have we have our major program is a cultural program, where we invite residents of Oshvinchim to take part in various cultural and educational events. Take place take place regularly, uh, in our in our museum in the synagogue and also at the Cafe Brixen, which is the museum cafe next door, the house of the last Jewish resident of Oshvinchim, with an exhibition space. So we have events both about particular aspects of the of the Jewish history of Oshvinchim and also the Jewish history of Poland. More generally, we talk, uh, we also educate about, um, about the history, obviously about the history of the, of the Holocaust and the, and the post-war and the post-war period, particular aspects. We talk about particular people, right? It's oftentimes uncovering and also, uh, and also keeping people up to date about the most, the most recent developments. We actually have a quite a large circle of, of fans of people who are our regular, our regular visitors. And on top of that, we also organize events related to history and human rights, right? So also to inspire people as part of our mission is to inspire people to connect this difficult history 
the, 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 over, the overall history of Jewish presence and the difficult history of, of the Holocaust with the, with the ethical choices that we, that, we make, uh, that we make. Today, we also have programs for, for kids, for youth, right? And these are both workshops in the synagogue and in the Jewish Museum, where they explore this history looking at authentic objects. Uh, and then we also have programs, we also have programs related to human rights, anti, also anti-bullying programs, again, to help them connect the, uh, the, well, the truth about human behavior in the past with the challenges that all of us are facing today. Thank you. Um, there's a question about whether studying the Holocaust um, and visiting Auschwitz is uh, part of the curriculum in Poland. Um, and maybe you can speak a little bit to cooperation between the Auschwitz Jewish Center and the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum and some of our programming? Mm -hmm. Well, the history of the war, the history of the Holocaust is part of the curriculum in Poland. And many of the students visit um, Auschwitz and other camps. I mean, you know, there are also other sites of camps in, in on the territory of Poland today. So this is definitely part of the education. I, well, the, the, the challenge is that, you know, in the case of Poland, we have this sort of maybe we can call it a competition of suffering, right? So on one hand, you know, there are people, of course, who, who commemorate, remember uh, what happened to the Jewish uh, inhabitants of Poland, but there's also the non-Jews who suffered. And, and there's often this kind of uh, tension to some extent, sort of, you know, well, people talk about the Jewish suffering, but they don't talk about the non-Jewish Polish suffering. So there are definitely also, you know, teachers who have maybe more of a nationalist point of view and they, you know, they may go to Auschwitz, but they may focus on the suffering of the non-Jews, not so much on the suffering of the, of the Jewish inhabitants of Poland. So this is, again, a, a big subject and a complex subject, uh, how this really is. Um, yes. Maciek, do you have anything to add? Maybe about the relationship um, with Right, with the, with the Auschwitz Museum. So uh, some of you may find it interesting talking about like space. Uh, the Auschwitz Jewish Center, the building you can see uh, in, our, in our backgrounds is located uh, basically slightly more than, uh, than two miles away from, from, uh, from Auschwitz one, one of the camps. So this is actually a, a vicinity and we work quite closely with, uh, with our colleagues at the, at the Auschwitz Birkenau State Memorial training, uh, training cadets and mids participating in our programs, also training graduate students who are fellows of, our, uh, of, of the Auschwitz Jewish Center. And to actually, we make a point that also participants of our professional development programs, such as law enforcement or teachers that were also mentioned before, they always, they always visit Auschwitz in a very in-depth way. We have um, co-designed programs with the Auschwitz uh, Birkenau State Memorial to, to look at particular, particular aspects of the history of Auschwitz, which, which is uh, relevant to our program. So we, we actually do work quite closely, especially in terms of education of professional groups and youth. Right, you have so young group groups, school groups from from Poland, from Germany, from from the United States who visit the Auschwitz Birkenau the former camps of Auschwitz Birkenau, and they also come to us on one hand to contextualize the history of the Holocaust and World War II, to get a better understanding of the impact that the Holocaust had and the World War II had on the town of Oshinjim, on its Jewish community, which was destroyed completely, but also to see how again how we can connect this knowledge with uh, with today. Thank you. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so I just want to briefly touch upon how you um, at the Auschwitz Gen Jewish Center have managed to respond to the uh, coronavirus pandemic. Um, and perhaps in doing so, you can talk about the app that um, was developed and, and how people across the world can still access a lot of the Jewish history of Oshvanshim through that. Absolutely. So as most of the world, we were slightly taken by surprise when, when, the, when the crisis happened. But luckily, uh, we, by that time, we were, we were running a lot of programs online already or in, in hybrid form. So for example, professional development programs for teachers, for Polish teachers, which are one of them is called the Anti-Discrimination Anti Education Academy was running already partly online beforehand. So this was quietly, there was actually, frankly speaking, a very quick switch for, for our participants who were already 
by that time was quite used to working online. And right now we're working 100% uh, remotely. Museums are locked down these days in Poland due to coronavirus, they're closed. So uh, we're working remotely, we're providing providing our services online. Uh, and this means that we're, we're teaching, we're running our seminars online. We're also planning a lot of work online. And on top of that, as, as Yael, you kindly mentioned, we have we have an app, which is called Oshpitim. This is the Jewish name of Oshpitim. You can, you can download it free of charge from both uh, App Store, Apple App Store and, and Google Play Store. And this is a, an app which, um, which is a guide to both the Jewish history of Oshpitim in our museum. So you can see highlights from our exhibit explained in four different languages, in, in English, in Polish, in Hebrew, and German. And then also uh, you can see, you can take a tour, a virtual tour of the town. If you're in the town, you can use the, the app to tour physically the sites. And many of those sites, uh, in many of those sites, it's not that obvious that there's Jewish history behind. So the app is, uh, is quite handy, but um, I also recommend it. Uh, and thank you for sharing the link. It's right now on the chat. Thank you, Yael. Uh, I would, we would very much recommend that you guys download uh, download the app and just just try it. I think you'll you'll learn a lot as a supplement to our to our meeting. And also sessions like this, of course, are wonderful because we can we can reach such a large audience and we can bring this this history to you that otherwise probably would would be much harder to to happen. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, there are, some clarif there are some questions about the Auschwitz Jewish Center today. So I just wanna clarify, um, the town is called Oshwenshim um, and has been since the end of the war. Um, and the Auschwitz Jewish Center opened in 2000 um, and merged with the Museum of Jewish Heritage uh, in 2006. Um, and there's been tremendous support from the local and regional governments for the work that the Auschwitz Jewish Center does. Um, and again, Tomek has been at the Auschwitz Jewish Center from the beginning and Machek has been there since 2006. Um, we will be sure to send all of their contact info and emails um, in the follow-up email. Um, there are many, many questions we didn't get to today. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, there were a few questions about the cemetery. So I just wanted to mention that there are uh, several publications that the Auschwitz Gen Jewish Center has put out um, that are available in our shop. Um, so we'll put the link to the shop in the chat as well as in our follow-up email. Um, and we encourage you to follow us uh, on social media. Um, and I just want to thank you all again for joining us today. And we hope that you learned some new information about the Jewish history of Oshwenshim. It's a very special place. And when travel is permitted again, it's safe. Uh, we encourage you to come visit us. Uh, and thank you again for your support, your support to preserve the Jewish history of the town. Um, if you'd like to donate, we will put the donation link again in the chat and, and we'll send it out again in the uh, follow-up email. And um, we know that we've shared many links. So again, we'll send them all out to you. Um, and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your evening or night. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.